Between 30 and 50 percent of all fires on board ships occur in the engine room, and that 70 percent of these are caused by oil leaks from pressurized systems. A major fire in the engine room often leads to a total loss of propulsion, putting the ship and its crew in danger and leading to expensive salvage and repair costs. Prompt action for an engine room fire is especially important. Because the most serious fires are those caused by oil, usually under pressure, escaping from running machinery. The resultant fires produce high temperatures and smoke, which in compact machinery spaces quickly reduce visibility and access to fight the fire. The heat buildup can also quickly lead to secondary damage to other machinery, particularly electrical cables and control and instrumentation systems. The triangle of fire, or the fire tetrahedron. So we are not going to go right back to basics. The aim of this title is to refresh your knowledge about dealing with fires in the engine room, and to prompt you to look at the procedures and systems specific to your own ship. When you have to deal with a sudden and unexpected fire, it is helpful to remember that the word fire is actually a good way of remembering what you should do. Find, inform, restrict, extinguish. That is usually the correct sequence of doing things. So, on finding a fire, inform, usually the bridge or control center for the ship at that time. Give as much detail as you can about where the seat of the fire is and any other relevant information, such as what is fueling it. And if there are other significant dangers, such as compressed gas cylinders nearby or vital equipment that might also be affected, restrict the spread of fire, heat, and smoke by shutting off fuel, ventilation, and doors to adjacent spaces, and only then start to consider extinguishing the fire if it is safe to do so. You might be faced with many different situations, and automatic fire detection and even automatic fire suppression systems may have operated. But keep these basics in mind. Most importantly, what do your own ship's procedures say you should do? Who should you report to, and how does that change in different situations? For instance, the engine room may be manned or unmanned. The ship can be at sea. In port or in a dry dock. What do your own ship's procedures say about tackling a small fire yourself with a portable extinguisher? Are there any circumstances where that course of action is recommended? Each situation in the engine room may be different, and shutting off fuel might be your first action in some cases. Try to think about these things in advance and discuss different scenarios with your colleagues. So, how can we prevent an engine room fire from spreading to other parts of the ship? Doors leading from the engine room should be kept closed at all times when not actually needed for access, and care must be taken to see that they are not left obstructed, meaning that they could not be closed in an emergency. This should prevent the spread of smoke and flames to other parts of the ship, and the engine room ventilation should also be shut down in accordance with the release procedures for the fixed extinguishing system. Whilst mentioning doors to the engine room, remember that in the event of a sudden large engine room fire, you may need to use an emergency escape route. Make sure these routes are kept unobstructed. And that you know where they are and how to use them. To prevent the spread of heat to the accommodation or adjacent spaces, boundary cooling may be needed. The methods of applying boundary cooling and which surfaces might need to be monitored in the event of an engine room fire should be part of the ship's emergency procedures and regularly practiced during fire drills. Prevention is always better than cure. So before we move on, let us just remind ourselves that most serious engine room fires are caused by oil spraying onto hot surfaces. We can eliminate this risk in two ways. 
Firstly, by good maintenance of oil piping and sheathing arrangements. Always ensure that fittings on oil lines are correctly tightened, and that sheathing arrangements on oil lines are refitted properly after maintenance. Secondly, hot surfaces like exhaust trunking must be properly insulated to reduce the risk of ignition in case of an oil leak. Make sure that insulation is properly refitted after maintenance. And kept in a clean, oil-free condition. Good housekeeping is essential. In a well-maintained, tidy, and clean engine room, there will be no oil spills to catch or accelerate a fire, and we will discover leaks much earlier than in a dirty engine room. In addition to the fire main, Solus and the Fire Safety Systems Code say that the machinery spaces must have one of the following fixed firefighting systems. A fixed gas system, a fixed high expansion foam system, or a fixed pressure water spraying or water mist system. Of course, these are the options for a fixed system, but there must also be portable extinguishers. The type and number of portable fire extinguishers in the machinery spaces is determined by the ship's classification society, based on Solas requirements. In a fairly typical case, you must have a portable foam-making applicator with one container holding at least 20 liters of foam concentrate and one spare, at least two foam extinguishers of at least 45 liters capacity, so that foam can be easily directed onto any fuel or lubricating oil system in the machinery space. Check what you have, where it is located. And what fires it could easily reach. Some class rules allow for equivalent measures for some fire extinguishers. For example, 25 kilograms of dry powder or 20 kilograms CO2 may be considered equivalent to 45 liters of foam. Because of the heat and smoke generated by an oil fire in the machinery space, fighting a fire with portable equipment would only be an option for a smaller fire. And when the fuel had been successfully shut off, tackling a larger fire would almost certainly require a team using protective equipment such as a firefighter's outfit, a spray jet from the fire main, and breathing apparatus. The safety of the team and their ability to reach the seat of the fire would have to be carefully evaluated before starting such an attempt. Use of the fixed system is therefore often the safest and most effective solution to a large engine room fire, especially if the fuel cannot be effectively shut off. Fixed gas systems, usually using CO2 and high expansion foam systems, have been shown to be effective at putting out large fires in the engine room, but are effectively one-shot methods. Once they have been used. The ship will be without a fixed system for the engine room until they can be recharged. The ship is therefore effectively out of class and needs to agree a solution with its classification society. This usually means heading for the nearest port where the firefighting system can be recharged, and repairs to essential equipment damaged by the fire can be carried out. There may therefore be some hesitation in using the fixed system, but remember that its early use may significantly reduce damage to the ship's equipment, and therefore be safer for the crew and more economical. Fixed pressure water spraying or water mist systems are kept charged with fresh water to reduce the chances of corrosion or fouling of the system. When activated. Some systems will be supplemented by additional seawater. The system will therefore need to be flushed through with fresh water after use. But generally, fixed pressure water systems are not regarded as one-shot systems. Of course, since the extinguishing medium is water, consideration must be given to possible damage to electrical equipment. However, since the amount of water used is relatively small. Especially for spray systems, and the initial discharge is fresh water, this is not of great concern, especially if a large and potentially destructive fire can be quickly extinguished by prompt activation of the system.
Water spray systems provide much more cooling effect than CO2 or high expansion foam systems, which is an advantage when considering re-entry to the engine room. The fixed gas system we are going to look at here is a high pressure CO2 system. High pressure bottled CO2 is the most common fixed gas system used for ships engine rooms. Low pressure CO2 systems are similar but store the CO2 at lower temperatures and therefore lower pressures by using an insulated, refrigerated CO2 storage tank. Halons are no longer used for fixed gas firefighting systems, but a number of gases such as Halotron 2, Inogen and Argonite have been used in fixed gas firefighting systems when approved by class. There have been many instances when fixed gas systems have not been properly released due to equipment failures or incorrect operation. It really is too late to start reading the instructions when there is a major fire. To put out the fire, it is important the gas charge is released in the way it is designed to be released. For CO2, Inogen and Argonite, this means that 85% of the gas must be released in under two minutes. For other gases, the release times are different. For instance, for Halotron 2, 95% of the charge must be released in under 10 seconds. The decision to release the fixed CO2 system is usually taken by the chief engineer, with the consent of the master. Procedures vary in different companies. Some say that the master makes the decision on the advice of the chief engineer. In any case, as we have said, since the fixed CO2 system is normally a one-shot system, this is a decision that must be carefully considered. It will also be necessary to have a muster and account for all personnel before releasing the system, since the resulting atmosphere in the engine room will not support life. Here is a typical procedure for the release of a fixed CO2 system, assuming that a decision has been made to release the system. Shut down machinery. Cut off fuel supplies. And ventilation systems. Close all doors and other openings and shut down ventilation, having first ensured that all persons have been evacuated and accounted for. Then go to the extinguishing system control box in the fire control room or CO2 room. Open the engine room control box door. This will cause an alarm to sound in the engine room and engine control room. Open operating valve number one first, followed by operating valve number two, by pushing the valve handles up. Release the contents of one pilot CO2 cylinder by opening the hand wheel valve. The other pilot cylinder is there as a standby. Pilot CO2 gas from operating valve number one will release the main cylinder bank. This pressurizes the CO2 distribution system as far as the engine room distribution valve, which remains closed at this point. Pilot CO2 gas from operating valve number two is directed to a timing device. After approximately 60 seconds, the timing cylinder will open and release its charge which acts on the pressure-operated engine room distribution valve. 
CO2 will now be discharged from the engine room nozzles. When the pilot pressure gauge within the control box is zero, close both pilot isolation valves. Allow time for structural cooling before considering opening up the engine room. For large fires, it may be 24 hours before it is safe to open the air intakes. And start ventilation fans from outside of the flooded space. Do not enter a CO2 flooded space without using breathing apparatus due to possible asphyxiation. The foam is a combination of water, air and the foam concentrate with an expansion ratio of between approximately 500 and 1000 to 1. A constant amount of a foam liquid is added to water by means of a proportioner and the resulting mixture of water foam concentrate is expanded with air in a foam generator by blowing it through a mesh screen. The covering of foam separates the combustion zone from the ambient air and stops any further vapour evaporating from the burning materials. The high expansion foam fills the flooded space and represses the atmospheric oxygen necessary for the combustion process. Here is a typical procedure for the release of a high expansion foam system assuming that a decision has been made to release the system. Shut down machinery. Cut off fuel supplies. and ventilation fans. Note that for high expansion foam, we need to allow air to be vented from the top of the engine room. So unlike with other systems, we keep upper level dampers, doors and openings open, whilst the high expansion foam is applied. Before applying foam, we must ensure that all persons have been evacuated and accounted for. Then, open the engine room high expansion foam control box door. This will cause the alarm to sound in the engine room and engine control room. Start the foam pump and foam generators. The detailed procedure of starting foam production depends on the type of machinery used in the ship. High expansion foam will now be discharged from the engine room foam generators. The filling rate is designed to fill the largest protected space within 10 minutes. Stop the foam liquid pump once the recommended quantity of foam has been discharged. Allow time for structural cooling before considering opening up the engine room. For large fires, it may be 24 hours before it is safe to open the air intakes. And start ventilation fans from outside of the flooded space. Do not enter a foam flooded space without using breathing apparatus due to possible asphyxiation from oxygen deficiency and the dangers from products of combustion trapped in the foam blanket. The water mist system delivers very small atomized water droplets in the form of a mist or fog. The mist fills the space and displaces air from around the fire. The fine droplets of mist remain suspended in the air and do not settle in the form of a water layer on which light burning liquids can flow.
That is why the mist system can be used for extinguishing flammable liquids such as oils. Some of the mist evaporates due to the high temperature of the fire, producing large amounts of steam. This way, the mist and steam create a smothering atmosphere, excluding oxygen from the space and absorbing the heat. In comparison to sprinkler systems, a mist system uses much less water. Unlike the CO2 and foam systems we have looked at so far, some water mist systems are designed to operate automatically. For an automatically released system, the fire detection system is an integral part of the water mist system and must be operational for the water mist system to function. In the event of a fire in a protected compartment, the solenoid release valve for that compartment will open and the pump will operate to supply high pressure water to the spray heads in the affected compartment. Let's take a look at how an automatic system operates in the event of a fire. Let's assume that the water mist system has been correctly put into operation in auto mode and that a fire then starts in one of the protected spaces. When the first fire detector is activated, an alarm is initiated. If a second detector in a protected space is activated, the water mist pump is started and the protected space solenoid valve is opened. The ongoing operation of the water mist system will also be displayed in the engine control room. Once the fire has been confirmed as extinguished, the water mist reset button should be pressed. This stops the water mist release in the protected area. Finally, the reset button should be also pressed on the fire detection system panel. We have seen how the water spray system operates automatically if two fire detectors are activated in a protected space. However, it is also possible to release the system manually. If the water mist system is operating in auto mode and a fire is observed, but the automatic release is not triggered, this is how to apply water mist manually. Please remember that the water mist pump has to be set in auto mode. We can release the water mist in the protected space manually by pressing the manual release button for the affected space. This release button will be located outside of the protected area. If manual release by the means of pressing the manual release button doesn't work, it is also possible to release the water mist by opening the bypass valve. The manual bypass valve is fitted in parallel with the solenoid release valve. When the fire has been extinguished, it will still be necessary to reset the water mist system and fire detection system as described earlier. If it is suspected that the failure to release automatically was due to a fault with either the fire detection system or a spray system solenoid valve, this should be investigated and repaired. The main risks when re-entering the engine room are the lack of oxygen caused by the fire itself and where high expansion foam, CO2 or a similar inert gas have been used. The intense buildup of heat. The possibility of reignition or even explosion if oxygen also enters the space. Hot fuel oil or oil vapors may still be present. Small fires may still be present and could cut off any firefighting team's escape. The lack of visibility due to smoke and remnants of the firefighting medium, coupled with potential hazards caused by damaged machinery or floor plates.
Leave re-entry as long as possible to allow the engine room to cool down. How much time depends, of course, upon the heat build-up and the danger to the ship, weather conditions, and the position of the ship. Initial entry should only be to assess the damage and any risks due to unburned fuel. Entry should be by a BA team with a water spray. The point of entry should be as low down as possible, since the heat build-up will usually be greater higher up in the engine room. CO2, for instance, is heavier than air, and will have built up at the bottom of the engine room. An airlock can be improvised to prevent the large amounts of air entering the space, which might cause an explosion of any remaining hot oil vapor. If safe, the engine room can be thoroughly vented. Ensure that the CO2 system is safely isolated from the engine room. This will prevent any remaining CO2 being accidentally discharged into the space. Before starting electrical machinery, check that cable runs have not been damaged in the fire. Starting diesel generators will help with ventilation and is probably the first priority to restore electrical power to the main machinery. This will then allow the engine room supply and exhaust fans to be started and the emergency generator to be taken off load, be stopped and reset to automatic. Cooling water pumps will need to be restarted as a priority to prevent diesel generators overheating and careful checks made for leakage due to any fire damage to equipment in the engine room. A minimum concentration of 21% oxygen is required before entry without breathing apparatus. And people need to be made aware of the possibility of pockets of CO2, or oxygen deficiency at low levels. A regular fire patrol and the avoidance of hot work will be required as a minimum until full firefighting capacity is restored. Engine room bilges will need to be lowered when foam or water have been used to extinguish fires. This should be done in accordance with normal MARPOL rules, unless the amount of water is such that it threatens the safety or stability of the ship. In that case, discharging the water by emergency means, such as direct suction to ballast pumps, may be considered, but only if this can be justified. The general principle for dealing with a fire on board ship is find, inform, restrict, extinguish. But for a large fire in the engine room, each case is different and we may be faced with two dilemmas. Firstly, shutting off the fuel should stop the fire but may mean loss of propulsion and a blackout. So what will the safest course of action be? Secondly, Using the fixed system will avoid risking personnel in the hazardous environment of a very hot, smoke-filled engine room. But some of these systems are for one-shot use. There is no easy answer that will be correct for every case. Check your own ship's procedures. Check that you know how to operate your own ship's firefighting equipment. This is not always easy. Sometimes access to equipment is limited for operational and safety reasons. For instance, opening the door to the CO2 cabinet will usually stop ventilation fans and cause machinery to stop. There is also an inherent risk with CO2 systems, for example, of accidental release. So make sure access to such equipment is properly authorized and controlled. Take engine room fire drills seriously and try and make them as realistic as possible whilst keeping them safe. And remember, prevention is better than cure, so ensure good maintenance and housekeeping practices, especially with pressurized oil systems.